Hello and welcome everyone to the 18th of the Faulty Shah learning series. I'm absolutely delighted today to be joined by Maria Ortuna, who's a member of our XCOM. So all of you, I'm sure, know Maria already. Um, she's a professor. Um, she's in the Risk Act Research Group at the Department of Earth and Oceanic and Ocean Dynamics of the University of Barcelona. Uh, she's very Hello widely... and welcome everyone to the 18th of the Faulty Shah learning series. I'm absolutely Apologies for that. Um, and um, she's very widely cited in on papers on the Betics and Pyrenees, um, over 1,650 citations, uh, H index of 20. And as we've, I'm sure many of us have heard her talk before. So we're really excited to hear more about the Betics from you today, Maria, and uh, really appreciate all the work that the Betics Lab has been doing as part of Faultisha. As always, I'd like to remind everyone that the, um, the aim of the Faultishar Learning Series is to help everybody work and understand papers written in different disciplines or in different locations. So the idea is to really use this as a chance to learn and then ask questions at the end if you have questions. This is your opportunity to ask questions. Sometimes in conferences, there's not time or sometimes you know things in a very specific area of research. The idea is this is a bit more broad for you. So again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much, Maria, and over to you. Okay, thanks so much, Joanna. Thanks for inviting me and also for challenging me because for me, uh, during this talk was um, was really interesting in a way uh, to select the, the information I was going to share, but also to, to try to explain um, an area that I am not so specialist uh, in this area regionally. So I'm, I've been working in some segments of some folds, but um, perhaps I don't, I understand better the Pyrenees, uh, but for me, it was important to, to, to give some hints of the, um, some updates of the knowledge that we have about how the, the Betics form. So I, um, I I thought that the beginning of the, the talk could be this geological setting that is not going to be an easy task. And then I will 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 give will take a trip to different folks that uh, are studied by by the team, the the, the, the lab, the lab team um I work with. So let's go. Wait, it's not working. Okay. Here you see all the, the people or most of the people that belong to the Fotosha Eastern Bedix CR Zone Lab. That is part of the Fotosha Working Group. Uh, and well, uh, this was this um, was created in 2017 after the Barcelona Fotosha meeting. We met in Madrid and we we are doing like constant uh, meetings online every once in a, in a while but the second large meeting presential meeting meeting was in 2022 there was another one online now that i remember also in 2022 um in the this last one this one year ago was in in alicante okay so in the web web page of the photo chat you will find this map trying to bound the area that we, the focus area, area what we consider uh, our natural lab. But you will see that these bounds are already very um, artificial. It's really hard to say that the, the area cannot be wider. But, uh, the bounds, um, as you see, can not cross some default, so something on, on revision, let's say. But at least what it's sure is that there is a continuity of all the structure that you will know a little better later. Uh, before um, any, any other thing, I would like to acknowledge all these people that uh, are part of the lab um, because, of, uh, because of their contributions, but also because um, most of the work I'm gonna show uh, on the on the active faults, the studies are made up by by these colleagues. So as I mentioned before, uh, let's do first uh, an overview of this general geodynamic setting that will le uh, let us understand better why these faults are active. Active. Well, 
Uh, okay, so the, the Eastern Bank, I hope you see my pointer around here. All this range is called the Bex range, okay? It's part of an erosion that includes the reef range that is here. All this Maghrebian uh, uh, reef that is also here. So all this form part of the same geological regional white unit. And as you see, uh, well, part of the Mediterranean bounded origins. But when we, when we pay attention to the seismicity, it's also true that uh, it's not probably so active as the, the area of Greece, even the Apennines, the Calabrian uh, belt. Uh, the seismicity is not as large, but still it's, it's a, a, a real thing. Also, you can see, well, this is also already not part of the Vedics, it's in the Atlantic, but we, we can have really large earthquakes here and many large earthquakes even in the, in the past were around magnitude 6, 6.5. This is the, um, the seismicity of the Iberian Peninsula, but in another scale, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, it includes the historical seismicity also. And you can see all these alignments and distribution of seismicity. Also, this is very, um, like, it's the attention, this alignment. And this will be uh, the present day uh, stress field, the, not, not a stress field, sorry, uh, velocity field derived from the geodesic studies. This is a compilation made by one of our colleagues. Uh, where we can see that the general uh, convergence uh, between Africa and Iberia is resolved here uh, with uh, a convergence rate around 5.4 millimeters. Yeah. We'll go into these more details uh, later. The faults in, within the area are part of the, uh, of the database that we use in, in, in the Spanish state also uh, together with the uh, colleagues from Portugal, that is the Quaternary Active Falls uh, database. And you see there are many, many, many falls that have been uh, considered and seismogenic, potentially seismogenic. If we do a, a, another zoom, zoom to the area, we can see here uh, this system was the source of large earthquakes, uh, but not in the 20th century, not, not in the 21st century, which is kind of scary because we know that uh, after this gap, we are trying, we, in, a, in a way we are waiting, not waiting, but expecting that probably we'll have maybe in, in the next decades uh, a large one. As you see, we have like 6.5 earthquakes uh, here. This is the um, Dalias earthquake, the Almeria earthquake in 500 the Vera earthquake, all of these are large. This one is in Lorca, a little probably uh, smaller. And the Torre Vieja earthquake, it was the largest and um, most recent earthquake, 6.6 .6 in 1829. Uh, since that earthquake in Torre Vieja, uh, we had uh, earthquakes that could be felt, some of them caused damage. Um, but the largest one is this one in Lorca, 2011 that caused uh, nine fatalities, but uh, affected a lot the, the city, many economical losses. And also around 7,000 people uh, have to be um, like moved to another places, uh, another houses. So now let's try to understand why, why the betics. This is a, a figure that I probably needed because I, I, I always have in mind the the image of the continental continental collision because I, I work, I spent uh, most of my time in the Pyrenees during my PhD. Uh, and this kind of erosions, continental continental um, collision erosions, so uh, sometimes more simple structure probably than the subduction related erosions, especially this one. Well, this is just to, to, to have a figure, this is from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, the, the erosions that are related with subduction can be more or less simple, uh, well, complex in a way, but for instance, the, the Andean, Andinian uh, erosion 
when our uh, regular rectilinear features are more um, predictable in a way, but when they are accurate, as you will see, this is a compilation of um, subduction arcuate orogens. And some of them are not active anymore, but these around the Mediterranean um, are orogens that we still don't really understand if they form uh, like more in a more straight pattern and then they were like closed or they they were always with this arcuate shape. And all of these have many uh, implications, as you will see. Right now, this is the, the map of the Mediterranean where this orogen related to, usually most of them, I think, um, thinning of the crust, uh, hyper, hyper extension, stretching, and then uh, subduction. So in a way, the Vetix and Reef, uh, Magravides uh, Reef, uh, uh, orogen, sorry, belt, be like the opposite uh, of this subduction front uh, compared to the Apennines and the Calabria Sicily arc. But, well, this is a closest zoom of the very like, simple structure of, the, of this uh, belt, where we have an external area made of rocks that used to belong to the Iberian uh, continental margin and African continental margin, that is the external zone. And then all these uh, internal zones that will be like the hinterland of the, um, of the erosion and that now are considered part of a separate uh, plate boundary, that is the, the uh, plate, sorry, the Alboran plate, Alboran domain. Here you see the same, the same but more, with more details. You see uh, the folds that we are going to, to see now are here more or less crossing in the, the previous structure of the erosion that was more parallel to the subduction front, uh, cutting them or less being bounded by, by the same limit. For instance, this is the limit between the internal hinterland and the external zone. This is the Clevillente fault. It's a neighboring fault. Sometimes we think, even why not, so the, the prolongation of one of these faults, the Alama de Murcia fault. So here we see how, how the structures that are today cut the more um, longitudinal structures produced by this um, accretion when the subduction was going on. Also, we have to take into account that the faults also are on, on the sea, shore. Uh, um, I like this image because we can see here. Well, this is an image where they, of a study that uh, proposed um, a structure for the area, for an uh, in depth structure, based on data of other authors and also on data on seismic uh, velocity waves, also seismic profiles. And then it's really useful because they mark here the limit in white of the Alboran domain. So it would be the, the, the limit in between the external and internal zones. But also here we can see all the crust that is being produced by this volcanic activity within the Alboran domain. Here, this blue line will be, will, will be showing the, the part of the Alboran domain that maybe it's um, made with accretion of continental crust from Africa. Uh, but in any case, the, the boundaries some, somehow are not, not really clear. So let's see how this arc, this arc create erosion was formed. You know, now I'm traveling very <laughs> uh, on time, the early Jurassic. You know, probably that the closure of the Neotetis ocean was Mm, was in, related with the origin, the opening of the Atlantic. So it was opening, and here it, uh, all this, you know, that this was being what, what, closed, closed, no? Disappearing. And within that context, all the little basins within the, like, uh, that were used by the break off of the Pangaea in the Mediterranean were being 
born generated. This was the, the Santonian of the, of the late Cretaceous. Here, this is a very different figure. I like it because we can see that during the Cretaceous and um, up to the, the early Paleogen, uh, it's been proposed that these uh, Iberian plates move towards the southeast, uh, generating the closure of the, um, the Tethys in this part, the generation of the Pyrenees. Uh, at that time, all this was uh, under the water. Okay? And then uh, some years, million years later, Really like this um, animation that was uh, I uh, well I took it from the supplementary material of this great pub publication by Droidin and Fatsina, uh, where you can see okay the Pyrenees are already formed and exhumed. Uh, it's the high the only relief within the Mediterranean. And you, we see here this is a very I mean simple simplification of the structure, but uh, very inspiring, let's say, or uh, useful for for see how how the the, the area was evol evolving by the southward migration of this subduction front that resulted in the opening of the Lig Liguro Provencal Basin. Okay, At the time that all this front was um, migrating, and all this dust was generated, was being generated. So 10 million years ago, already we had the, the erosion assumed and the, the, the reliefs that we find now in the continent. Right now, what we have, well, 5 million years ago, is still this propagation towards the west. Now, this will be a simplification of the main uh, subduction zone. However, there is a lot of debate and discussion about this uh, the, the exact air, um, location of this subduction front. And I'm going to show you some, some models that still are debated because there are still publications. You see, you will have here the subduction front. This is the under uh, steam plate. Instead of this, here we have different proposal or this. Or these, even here, where the, the under thrusting plate is the Alboran plate. This is, these are a population of the authors that right now are publishing and um, support these models. Of course, there are more people working on that and they use data of other people. But it's interesting the, the variety of, uh, of models. In any case, the more clear thing, I think it's uh, the more. The Broadly accepted is that there, there are subduction of this uh, lithospheric, uh, oceanic lithospheric crust here, and also some continental around the Gibraltar area. This is a model, a 3D model. Uh, this will be Gibraltar, Africa, Iberia, and some models uh, proposing that the, this slab is underneath. It's been here. So there is a like a disconnection, both in the African side and in the Iberian plate. This has not a lot of seismicity, so it's not so clear to, to, to um, see the, the shape of this slab. But still, uh, this is mainly based uh, on velocity anomalies of the seismic waves. This is another model, but uh, also very clear, similar one. And this has consequences. Uh, mainly, well, I think it's important to have uh, this in account to understand why every once in a while there are, we have um, deep earthquakes, 600 kilometers depth sometimes. And also, why this mountain range uplift so high? This is also quite important. So, there are other. Uh, sketches, figures that uh, Medina Cascales did for his PhD. I really think I, I am thankful to Medina, uh, to Ivan Medina, because I, I use many of the, his figures that I think they are great. Uh, explaining the different hypotheses, um, and this will be another simplification. All these hypotheses, the lamination, slab break, slab rollback, removal of the leader are still on the debates. 
and if there is one of them, perhaps this one that is more accepted. But it's not my field of expertise. So I, I just wanted to show the complexity that we still don't understand exactly what's going on. From the PhD of Ivan Medina, I also took this reconstruction, um, a little more detail of uh, how this uh, front was forming and moving toward the west. And, uh, oh, I don't see the. In the Miocene, uh, the situation was um, so many of the ranges were already emerged, but there were may, uh, between the ranges. Mm, the ranges maybe they are not exactly the same that today. There were um, continental or semi-continental basins that uh, turned later into um, exoraic and the rake, sorry, basins towards the Mycenaean crisis. And the situation now is this one. Uh, a little different because there was an inversion. During the late, uh, during the late Miocene, there was mainly extension and some transtension. But many of these structures uh, were reactivated by the late Miocene, very late Miocene, as reverse and um, uh, it's like a slip fault in the eastern part and as normal falls in the central part. So, mm -hmm. we are in the geographic reconstruction of this basin. But many of the deposits of these basins are lifted and uh, for in the upstream wall of the of the active falls. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very recent paper that is in press where you, we can see the, the distribution of this basin, but also in relation with the, the, the Betic Strass front, or this would be more or less the, the fault. The limit in this case is more the gradient default, where the limit between the, the external and the internal area. Well, this is always like um, helps to understand how sometimes. We, we find these evaporites, uh, many marls and, and gypsum deposits, but now we find them in the in the upstream world. And also the importance of all these salts in the activity of the faults, because um, we, we can see as many of the behavior, what much of the behavior of the faults at some segments is controlled by, by the presence of these um, salt deposits. From the late Miocene. Okay, so let's go back to the area and finish the, the geological setting. We'll show you some cross sections of this area. Mm, sorry, the more the more representative of the eastern beds. So when I, when we focus on the, in the eastern beds, I have to say that it's in the internal of the eastern Betics, because there are some other active faults in the Prebetic that I we are, we are not studying in our team. And this cross-section um, is showing more the, those, those active faults you see here, from part of a thrust uh, bed affecting these external units. And all the, the creationary like, um, well, terrains that part, form part of the Alborand domain. Here, just to uh, show you that there is like a stack of these core complexes or tectonic complexes that were formed by aggression related to the subduction. But still, the, the main trend of these structures is, um, is due to north-south compression. They are, they are anticlines, synclines, orient with the, um, um, with the fault axis oriented more or less east west let, let me see i think there's an image now yes this image can be okay, fine so uh, on the central part we see the development of these anti-formal ranges that are not affected on the bounds by normal faults and in the eastern part we see that uh, well north northwest southwest Southwest, the, the ranges are staying more northwest, southwest, but, but are also affected by these transpersonal faults. 
this will be a little the the situation um, also like considering the the geo the sea that we see today so let's go now to focus in this eastern more part of the of the range in green in red sorry uh, you have the, the faults that we focus on and we discuss and we introduce in our models the seismic hazard models Mm, that form part of what uh, traditionally was considered the Eastern Betic shear zone, also called Transalboran shear zone. But we have to say that this concept, mm, in a way, should be revised. Because, for instance, uh, the box fault that is here, and I will show you some pictures we studied in the early 20,000. It really seems connected to the Alama de Murcia fault. So I don't think that we can have a boundary here because a fault rupture here can provide, in my opinion, along the Albox fault. Also here, all the Bujaras corridor, um, it seems to, to be kind of a rebounding block. It is a single block that has been extruded between this corridor and the Tramonera fault. The same thing happened when between Crevillente Fault and Bajo Segura Fault. That's why I think uh, sometimes we need seems that we need to close systems and draw boundaries. But in geology, in these complex areas, uh, the distribution of the deformation, I mean, is not that doesn't understand of boundaries, let's say. Also, it uh, doesn't understand of post lines. Uh, as you see here, the Palomares fault probably uh, goes into the continental platform on the sea, but also clearly the Carboneras fault has been that's, that's already studied. As all uh, a large part, um, almost half of, of it or more, on uh, offshore. But if you see how even the seismicity is really like telling us that perhaps there is a system propagating towards uh, towards Africa. So I don't know, it's been almost 25 minutes. <laughs> um, I'm gonna switch to focus on the on the active faults. If you think I'm I'm going too fast or you want to interrupt me, it will be a pleasure. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, get, re get ready because we are going to, to see many well, a summary of the studies that the many studies that took place in the last decades in the in this area. So main faults uh, studied by all these people that I show you that form part of the of the lab are Alama de Murcia fault, also called Lorca fault, and Albox, that is that tiny segment that is the continuation that perhaps connect with other eastern faults, western faults, sorry, towards the west. And then in the other side of this depression, we have Carboneras, Palomares and Northern Falls, as Toyos Fault, Carrascoy, and Bajo Segura. In the next slides, um, I prepare this graph because I, I know not, all, not everybody is familiar with these faults. So I will, in, in uh, any, so repeatedly, at different moments, I will remember you which part of the system we are thinking about. Here, the, the north is towards that corner. And also, I want to I wanted also to acknowledge that um, all people working in this area, not, we are not the only people working here. We, we consider uh, their studies complementary or background, so and, or we still cooperate with them. So uh, when we meet, uh, as a team, the, there are some key, quest, key questions that we try to solve, especially because we see that we need the interaction between us. <laughs> we need the collaboration to, to solve them. Uh, each of us is maybe focusing on, on, on a geological aspect or a, a seismic hazard aspect, but any of us has the all the data, all the information, all the big those questions are referred to the interaction, the fault interaction, basically to estimate how uh, how is the the larger, most uh, 
uh, damaging rupture visible or different scenarios doesn't have to be the larger that can can result from a surface rupture of these faults also determine which fault sections are more hazardous in general which are longest or have uh, higher speed rates or uh, also regarding the lapse of time which one we see there are many many years that didn't break but broke in the past and also how the geological and geodetical data should be organized when we use it them uh, in the in the models because um, we, we we could see how sensitive the models are to these parameters and sometimes the parameters are not well defined and introduce a lot of errors so you can have a lot of data but if they are not certain or they are not well uh, defined it's a little useless in a way. Okay, um, now before going into the geological data, I'm gonna show you the geodetic knowledge that I think it's really important. And sometimes we forget a little to, to take into account that we already have, uh, well, many years of uh, observation and some results that are telling us quite a lot about the, the dynamics, the kinematics of the foods. This is a compilation that may uh, presented uh, recently. Yeah, I think I showed it before. Don't, don't pay attention on these large rows <laughs> because they are uh, the product of the subsidence uh, within the Lorca area basin due to the sobreexploitation of the aquifers. So they, they had to be removed. In the next um, figures, you will show some results with this um, filtering. But in general, more or less, there is a large number of um, continuous and some survey station, and many people working, sharing the data, and so on. So let's start uh, the southern part. This is Carbonera's fault. And we already see the differential movement of the, of the blocks, both sides of the, of the fault. And this led to some to these people, uh, Guia and also Anna Chevarria and her PhD, that to define that this fault moves uh, a left lateral fault uh, rates a little larger than one millimeter per year. So it's for for our <laughs> standards is quite a lot. So yes, we are in this part of the of the map here. If we move a little to the north, this will be the continuation of Carbonera's Palom Palomares fault. And this is a map recently presented by Alejandra Staller and uh, collaborator, uh, collaborators, where the signal of the subsidence is already filtered. And still we see how we can already say that some of the faults that even were so to be Inactive of very very slow fault like the Palomares fault send differential movement and um, well, a general pattern of in this region of a uh, lateral left lateral flip. If we move towards the north, so this map corresponds to this central area, and more to the north, we have the the, the studies of the people the Alicante team. Uh, Maria, Maria Jesus Borke and collaborators published this in 2019. Uh, they have like this local uh, network of uh, genetic data. And we can see here uh, two images. Uh, on, the, on the left, we see um, the, um, the, the vector re uh, resulted of the, on, when we uh, decompose the slip vector uh, perpendicular to this section that is parallel to the Clevillian default. And we obtain this, well, this is 0 0.2, 0 0.7 millimeter gear. So it's not very, very high, but still it's active moving. And it turns out that the um, uh, horizontal um, strike slip component is a little larger, at least the minimum. Okay, so this will be like the, um, the composition uh, along the strike of this. These are the faults of the, the, the northern termination of the eastern Betis shear zone. 
desde Bajo Segura a Folk, into the, into the Mediterranean. So we put it in this part of the system. It's interesting, I think it's very interesting, uh, these authors propose that these uh, movements could be reflecting some kind of extrusion, extruding tectonics, because of this indentation, that is the Aguilas uh, Cartagena arc, this is like a crust, um, well, little sphere block, let's say, that is like uh, being included here, can explain the, the shape of these faults that are, uh, and also the, the, the main uh, orientation of this GPS data. But this is the northern part of the system. Also, interestingly, interestingly in the southern part of the system, if you see here the Carbonate asphalt and the uh, Cross Corridor, there were other um, models also based in, in UBS data by Echevarria et al, inspired also in, in some uh, geotectonic models uh, already proposed by Martinez Diaz, where all this could be some kind of a web also like escaping because of this convergence. So these are models that are important to take into account when we try to understand what, what we see in the field. Of course, maybe we're not all the time like this, but at least they seem to be like that now. Uh, in the following slides, I'm gonna do like this trip through the different folds, but um, especially you, you have to remember that the, our fo uh, focus, our aims are to determine if the folds are not seismogenic. Also the slip rates, if there is a slip partitioning, Positioning, partitioning, I don't know. Um, the earthquake behavior uh, in terms of earthquake chronology, if we see that there is clustering or not, most of most of them, most of the time what we find is clustering or not, we are not able to, to say if the, the faults are really well behaved and constant because of the date uncertainties. Also, when we talk about triggering relationships infer from geological data, we we are we don't have enough data enough, or maybe I don't know if we could have at some point, um, as to be able to compare the, the chronologies of different faults and say if they were or not uh, simultaneous. So the ruptures were not simultaneous. This is like something very um, ideal and well, I don't think right now we'll be able to to, to solve it. Just using the, the paleochronologies. The segmentations that are really um, having an impact on the seismic hazard models. And also, we pay attention on, on the maximum earthquakes that these boats can produce, also the lapse of time. So, let's start by this fault that uh, bounds the system. Um, so, the north is here, the north wave. Okay. And this has been the focus of doctoral PhDs, doctoral uh, studies, <laughs> PhD studies. Um, these are the last ones at this um, in the last decade. Okay, all of them focus focus on on this Amade Murcia fault. But as as I told you before, I wanted to show you the box fault. That is this continuation of the fault. That is a clearly reverse fault uplifting the Stancia's range and affecting all these alluvial funds. You can see here some trenches that we did already in 2002. And we're showing all these alluvial funds completely folded and just over on younger material. Um, well, this is just a hint. As you know that this paper exists and that this fault is active. We, we don't have to, for, we, we should not forget it. Also, I, I can tell you that towards the west, we can follow the trace of this fault when you go to more to the west. Okay, now we go to the western termination of the Lama de Murcia fault. We are here. Um, it's one of the places where we started starting doing multi-trench analysis along this uh, horse tail 
discrimination. Um, I, I, I'm not going to into the details of this paper, but uh, we started starting to play uh, with the possible um, sim uh, simultaneous or not uh, correlation among trenches. There were seven trenches. Uh, and also realizing how large were our our time ranges, our um, our uncertainties. Okay, so so in this area, some years later, uh, Marta Ferrater uh, obtained the slip rate because the the channels only based on the on the offset of the channels, the the ages of the alluvial fans, on top of which the channels were. Seized. And we, we were seeing how some values were, well, more or less high, to be part of uh, branches. So it was more or less accepted that this food, even in, in the Western termination, uh, was having a millimeter per year displacement. Now, if we move to other parts of the fold, this is a compilation that Paula Herrero Barbero did in her PhD. Um, by that time, collecting all the different papers and publications, showing the, the wide variety of sleep rates. But also we have to take into account sometimes some of these sleep rates were only referring to one whole brand. One of the challenges here has been to integrate the different fault branches, not just um, trying to understand the one that is the most clear. Because uh, we were realizing that in one fault branch, so the slip rates were smaller. And that was uh, Octavia Gomez Novel did in her his PhD. I will show it uh, in some slides. Uh, but in any case, in this part of the fault, the fault seems to, well, not to move so fast in the northern part. The segment. And um, it's been where uh, Paula Herrero uh, focused in trying to analyze better all this segment. So, Paula uh, tried to understand um, in her PhD uh, the activity of the Lama de Murcia fault, is the fault plane. Now we are seeing the system from the north. So, the north is here. And she analyzed analyzed all these uh, markers, ref reflectors from the seismic profiles, also combining them with field data. This is another view. And uh, focusing on, on markers that were from light myosin. Uh, so finally, she, she updated some, at least some accumulated uh, slip rates that have been useful to, to, to see at least, to have some more well-defined numbers. This is another, also, um, well, the analysis of the throw and a kind of complex reconstruction of the of the markers in this northern termination of the of the fold. Uh, let's go back to the center central part here. That is where the fold is so clear, effectively the quaternary. And uh, well, you see, this is from Octavio Gomez uh, PhD. So the fold here. Split up to five uh, fold branches, and usually what it creates um, are a series of chaps. In fact, um, well, we, we're going to see some more, some more figures that maybe are here. We have the ridge that um, bounds the depression that is here um, from the all this corridor where the quaternary alluvial funds are being tapped next to the standard range. And Octavi also did multi-trench analysis to be able to characterize and complete a cross-section of this fault. So this is the tectonic barrier, the, the, the ridge blocking the sediments, um, the alluvial fan. And you can see how nice is the, the expression of this. Um, this will be the northern side of the pressure ridge. And not so clear the southern boundary, but we, we just in on one of the branches. This is another um, from a drone where we see here the pressure ridge. It's not impressive, but <laughs> and also you see that it's made of marls in many parts, so easily erodible. But still, 
uh, it's clear. So the line is quite clear. We did this section and uh, observed also many natural outcrops and did this uh, trenches. Okay, so he was able to, to complete the rupture history at, along one single transect. But focusing on the on the rupturing history, not that much on refining the slip rate. That was something that was made in a former thesis by Marta Ferrater. Uh, that the, the name of the that the title of the of the thesis was already that, that refining the slip rate of the Alama de Murcia fault because all the trenches made and that day were always two deep trenches. And this was the first time, well, the second, because in the in carbon in carboneras were also applied. But we applied here for the first time the 3D trenching analysis. We were able to locate uh, these panels uh, displaced by default and refine the, the uplift rate, uplift rate um, combining the trenches analysis and also the geomorphological analysis. So more or less, this was the number that we got applying applied for the last 100,000 years. And also this was quite um, impressive uh, to see that the most recent events were given very large slip per events. We still don't know if these are, uh, this is one event or more than even one event. It's hard for us to believe these large structures. Mm. Another interesting thing in this fall, more to the well, in the central sector, but in the south of Lorca City, we have here the fall so clearly the all the, um, the land where, where the um, uh, lights were like a soil basement here and here against Miocene sediment affecting a uh, quaternary alluvial fans. So, in this area, uh, Martinez Diaz. Uh, and collaborators, I include here, <laughs> uh, in the in the bottom of a um, creek. That was something we we were always discarding. We, we didn't think that we were able to, we, we were going to be able to detect recent ruptures in very young sediments. But when we were trenching in this bottom of the um, of the creek, we found. Um, uh, an old um, archaeological, well, it was a, an irrigation ditch. You see here, completely displaced by one pole plant. The displacement was 55 centimeters, but still, we don't know if what, that's the total um, slip per event because maybe it was on only one branch, but we could date it and point it to this uh, historical earthquake that occurred in the Islamic times. Uh, coming back to the PhD of Octavi, uh, we also did the first um, mega trend study. But it, it's difficult to, I mean, in general, I, it has an environmental impact. But now I understand how critical uh, it is to, to be able to go deep and uh, study in a place that is really um, spectacular, this place. Also, no, there is not much population around, and you can work with some. Well, it's, it's a place that you can work, not bothering. So this is still open. It would be great even to protect it as a educational site. And in this trend, um, uh, in this thesis, thesis, we were able to identify up to seventy events the last 100,000 years. So this was Lola's extent back on time, the chronology that Marta Ferrater already was uh, had studied in this former thesis. This is still not published, only it's, it's in the PhD that is accessible, but uh, gave us also a good idea of the behavior. So not so... Mm, um, not so not so regular behavior, but still uh, the coefficient of variation. I don't remember exactly now uh, the result, but it was not not so so clustered. But of course, you have to see that the uncertainties that we use to calculate uh, if, the, if the behavior is not regular are really large uncertainties. 
and we were getting this recurrence recurrence interval. Okay. Yes, we we have here the the coefficient of variation, so quite quite regular. Uh, I'm I think I'm just oh it's really late. So you find more details in the, the PhD of uh, Octavi. Another thing that we could um, infer is the sleep variability uh, along the time. That is something that was also detected for the Carrascoe fund. I'm gonna go fast here. Only want to show you this um, is the in 2010 that focused the author and author, uh, characterizing in a very nice way the, the, sleep, the strike sleep behavior of the Carrascoe fund. Also doing the third trenches. Here in La Serrat, where this, this were the data from the on, um, offshore. And um, also doing very nice mapping of the area of this uh, ridge, um, ridge, ridge, that is La Serrat range. So these were some changes uh, done before well, for the Chimena um, Moreno thesis. And these are changes that we've been studying in the last year. We published in 2018. Mm, I don't, sorry, this was the, this on the north side, and the one published in 2018. And these are uh, have to be published. So here we also applied uh, 3D drain trips, then like isolating small pieces of channels to um, catch the rupture that we consider the, the rupture of the Almeria earthquake. Because of the the age of the affected and not affected uh, material in five five hundred twenty two, but this has not been published yet. Uh, all this was a huge amount of work uh, mapping the the channels that we were finding in the trenches, and I hope one day this can be also published. Let's move very quickly because I, I see that too too many information. Sorry. So these are the posts that I'm going to talk to you. Uh, this is ongoing PhD of Julia Molins that recently started in the Palmer uh, Asphalt. So we move here. We jump on Asphalt, we are not here. And this fault was believed to be very slow, but now nobody had really characterized the activity and the, the expression on the landscape is really clear. Uh, so we started to do the first, well, not the first, but uh, our trenches of our team. And this is really fresh material uh, from three weeks ago or so, where we could find uh, the formation of um, alluvial funds that we have to, to date now. At least we think a couple of events, and you have some unpublished figures yet. So. Uh, Hope that during along the PD of Julia Molins, she will be able to better characterize and understand all the activity of this uh, fault because uh, I didn't say that, but um, this fault not not being able to to have good data on this fault was really um, having a, a bad impact in the seismic hazard results because. Uh, this large uncertainty, and also we were that it was almost not moving. Now we realize it's quite well; it's active at least, and needs to be better characterized. More to the north, Los Toyos Falls. You also see here the studies of the colleagues of Madrid, uh, that were able to characterize falls that don't, don't have that much expression, but uh, resulted in quite a lot of earthquakes. And the transfer faults, in a way, well, the, the link, the secondary faults that uh, link Palomares with Carrascoe fault. And Carrascoe fault, um, this is a, a pic from, from the from the bus, I think. Um, Carrascoe fault it was the focus of the PhD of uh, Raquel Martin Banda. And you see the um, a fault that has different really mapped segments market segments. This is the, the, the coastline, line, the, the east. See how here how here the the range is not as high and suddenly it has this um, larger height. So um, 
Patel and, and her colleagues determined that the default was segmented and uh, that there were parts characterized by two reverse faults and parts that were characterized by, by a strike slip but that are more into this part. I don't know why the, the image is not showing. Okay, in any case, uh, they did um, uh, explore different sites uh, with paleosmological studies and also a lot of geomorphology, uh, incorporating the dating of uh, calcrete horizons that were helpful to, to date and constrain the, the flip rates. And the summarizing figure that Raquel um, produced was this figure where, where we can see how the fold is more rectilinear and simple, more simple structure here. And towards the southwest, there are different fronts. So it is placed in different fold, uh, fold branches that have a larger first component, also only because of the change in orientation. And you can see here the variety of slip rates um, that have been have been published in, in this front end paper. Well, I think I have to. Well, one, one of the things also Raquel came out with came out with uh, is the um, suggestion that the fault probably move uh, following super cycles. So that's an idea that we have to explore and see if it's also observed in other fault systems. Um, and to finish, to finish, we got the northern part of the fault system, the Bajo Segura fault. This fault um, has not been studied uh, with trenches, um, but uh, there are seismological information. Uh, there is seismological information coming from the study of seismites in in the lacustrian like, sediments or deposits on the northern block. Also, it has a clear uh, morphological expression um, where you can see these ranges that are structural uh, landscapes, also affected by some kind of transfer faults. Uh, but in any case, um, continues towards the sea because the, the work um, made by Perea, Perea showed how this fold is cutting through the late quaternary sediments of the of the seafloor. In any case, you have here a summary of the parameters. And in this paper also by Raquel Martin Banda, uh, you have a collection of the updated. Now, these are, I think, the most updated uh, slip rates for the area. You can see how the, depending on they are uh, vertical or strike slip, they are different. Also, depending on the period we consider, they are different, but more or less maximums are one in between one and two millimeters. Yes. So this one that was unknown, we can consider that with the PSD of Paul Herrero, even using old markers, but it, it can be constrained around 0 0.30, 32 millimeters. Okay, so let's conclude and finish with the talk. The take home message. Uh, in my side is that uh, we have to take care of these boundaries that we like to draw or need to draw uh, when we analyze systems. Mm, and really try to consider that some ruptures can propagate towards uh, faults that are neighboring, even if traditionally they, are, they have not been considered uh, in, the, in the system. Also, we have to dedicate time to better determine the depth geometries uh, with using subsurface data. Uh, better know the slip positioning, and also to see if what we see in the surface really um, all all the the slip that we can see uh, on depths. And finally, uh, this idea of earthquake conversation that. It's interesting because these faults are so close to air that it's quite um, understandable, expectable that when one breaks, the other is triggered. So all these models are also um, the object of a study and, and I think they have to, to be developed. Finally, just a, a suggestion because I know that all these colleagues are doing a Photoshop um, fault-based uh, seismic hazard assessment. 
I I didn't want to go into the the, the results they are uh, obtaining, but I suggest that perhaps one of these could have the the next uh, learning series. So many thanks. In that tool. You're still there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. That's absolutely fantastic. I, I know so much more now than I did at the beginning, which is, is what we can ask for. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, we don't have a lot of time, but any quick questions that anyone would like to ask, please just put your hand up in Teams or put your camera on and say hi. Perhaps it's a plea from one of those you have uh, suggested for the next talk to say to say yes, <laughs> you know? um, and do do get in touch with me um, as I always say on the messages. If there's a topic you would like to hear about or someone you'd like to hear from, do let me know and we can try and make sure we get what people want in these in these series. Maria, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate today. Um, and as I say, we learned a lot. Um, and there's a message in in the chat about an upcoming coming conference that people hopefully can, can see. So um, see you all soon, see you all next time. And uh, thank you again, that was really fantastic. Thanks so much. And um, thanks for your patience. I know it was a lot of...